as, as way of introduction, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Lloyd Humphreys. I'm uh, the managing director here at Orca, and I'll describe kind of a little bit about what Orca does uh, shortly. But I'll, I'm also a clinical psychologist uh, by training, so um, a mental health professional. So, so I'm going to be talking about this for, from a number of different angles. Firstly, as a clinician, but also as a technologist uh, in the sector as well. So, uh, and please um, uh, interrupt me as we're going uh, through the session. You know, we don't necessarily need to kind of wait until, until, until the end of the session in order to kind of answer questions. So either put your hand up or even kind of, um, you know, please just kind of take yourself off on mute and interrupt me as we're going along. So. So the session really is about finding the right uh, online resources uh, to help manage mental health and well-being. And whilst I, uh, the, the kind of the title ostensibly is about how do we find uh, online resources to help ourselves, um, in terms of kind of mental health professionals, it's also how do we support uh, the clients that we work with as well. So it's, it's going to be kind of looking at, at the various different angles. And I guess if we're able to select those right resources for us, us, then we're able to also support the clients with whom we work as well. So where I'm going to get started with is just in terms of kind of the digital opportunity. And I, and I guess the digital opportunity is that digital both offers that opportunity, but also a bit of a threat as well. Digital has the power to be divisive, but it also has the power to bring us together. It can have the power to isolate us or for us to feel completely connected uh, to, to, to people around us. So it is a mixed bag. So, so it's not about kind of finding out, you know, just in terms of kind of tarnishing digital with the same brush. But equally, it's about kind of taking a measured approach where we don't say all digital is the panacea and the answer to, to all of our kind of problems. But there is a digital opportunity. We know that 93% of healthcare providers see the benefit of kind of digital technologies. And whilst these, these statistics on this slide show us an overall uh, kind of uh, digital health opportunity, if we start to have a look at mental health, you know, there were some months within the pandemic where a third of all treatments um, in primary care mental health was delivered digitally. And we can see in terms of uh, helping kind of healthcare professionals, there was a huge kind of initiative in terms of being able to kind of support frontline care workers with a the right range of resources. So we know that digital health uh, has the potential to kind of help. The problem we find is that there are over 365,000 digital health products to choose from. So how on earth are we expected to know which ones are safe which ones are effective and which ones are going to work for us. Um, and that's kind of really important, not just in terms of kind of choosing for clients, but, but which ones are going to help us. And with such a myriad of choice, we need to kind of decide how we can determine which are the good ones, which ones are the bad ones, and which ones are going to be kind of the ineffective ones that are just going to be deleted from our phones. But imagine if there were 365,000 medications on the market and we have no guidance to decide which ones we should take for which conditions. We would kind of be lost in, in the kind of a sea of kind of uncertainty. And so we need some help with this. And typically what kind of what happens is when faced with such a choice, both kind of organisations, whether that's an NHS uh, mental health trust, whether it's a GP or whether it's a kind of a choice for ourselves, we tend to kind of pick just a single app for us to use. So we just tend to kind of pick, and that might be the one with the highest kind of user ratings on Apple App Store. It might be the ones that our friends have kind of recommended. And that's kind of potentially OK, but there's going to be lots of kind of pitfalls with that unless we take a, a measured approach to this. So imagine if the same were true with other treatments. We don't just pick the same antidepressant for, for everyone who presents with depression. We don't just provide cognitive behavioural therapy for everyone who turns up with anxiety. And so we need to be able to provide that choice. And so how do we deliver that choice, that trust and that safety and a way for us to use these products? Well, there's a few things that, you know, a few simple steps that we can kind of take in order to kind of determine that. The first one is, uh, most importantly, kind of creating trust. But the first element is awareness. 
that not everyone is in the same place. We don't all experience the same kind of air, have the same experiences. We're all somewhere on this continuum from in crisis all the way over to the other end of the, the continuum, which is excelling. And the interesting thing is that we all move up and down this continuum, you know, sometimes even on a daily basis, but more often on a weekly or monthly basis, we move up and down this kind of continuum. And therefore, if we move up and down this continuum, it's about if we're going to choose that online resource, it's about kind of knowing where we are at which stage, because that determines the type of support that we need and potentially the types of technologies that can help us. And so there isn't a one size fits all when it comes to an app or an online resource. And whilst it might be kind of joyous for to say that, yes, this is the panacea, this is the one that we're going to use. And whilst kind of technology providers would love to kind of say that they are, there's certain ones that are going to be very good at different stages. And so that's the first kind of criteria. And it sounds an obvious one, particularly if we work in this space. But actually, it's really important to kind of have that first as the starting point. The next thing that we need to do is we need to match that online resource to where that person knowing what type of help that that person might be requiring at the right time. So, for example, if I'm feeling, you know, excelling, then I'm going to kind of want, oops, sorry, uh, the, the kind of the slide on the end in terms of excelling is incorrect. But if I'm excelling, I'm going to be wanting apps that are going to really maximize my kind of life experience. That might be social media. It might be kind of going out for walks. It might be ways that I can interact with others. Whereas if I'm thriving, but sometimes feeling a little bit low, then maybe I need to dip into some apps that are going to help lift me up from time to time. It might be one that's on demand that I can just reach into, or it might be one that's just bubbling away in the background that's kind of helping me along in the, the times that I need it. Whereas if I feel like I'm in that surviving mode, then I'm going to kind of need much more kind of help. I'm going to kind of need those apps that might have a focus on specific mental health areas that might be kind of low mood or anxiety, but being able to kind of dip into much more kind of formalized kind of approaches. And if I'm struggling, then I'm going to need much more structured interventions, perhaps with support from a mental health professional, a hybrid approach. And then if I'm in crisis, then I'm going to need those apps that are going to kind of put me into touch with those services that are going to help. So we need to kind of match the, the technology to where we are at any given point in time. And some of those apps cross many of those bridges, but it's really important to kind of recognize the type of intervention we need, which is often why when, you know, mental health services just pick one particular app, it's not as effective as, as it could be because we're kind of giving that app to everybody at every stage. And therefore we need to kind of provide you know, perhaps a selection of different technologies to match those technologies to where people are at. And secondly, we need to kind of have trust and trust in those technologies. So not only an acknowledgement of kind of where we are, but actually, you know, trust in those solutions that we are going to use. So the first element to trust is to recognize that not all mental health and well-being apps are the same. It goes back to my previous point that actually, depending on where you are, depends on the type of app that you might or technology that you might want. So, for example, a general well-being, you don't need randomized control trials to show you how effective it might be. You know, a general well-being one might be just around about kind of social media, social connectedness. It might be about exercise apps. It might be signposting, nutrition advice. And so we don't need a huge amount of evidence because it's keeping us well. We then might move into low acuity mental health support. These apps are designed to support existing healthcare pathways in some way. It might be when someone is on a waiting list or going to their GP for low mood. And they might have some form of integration with existing processes or might kind of sit outside of them. That might include mood diaries, mindfulness, social prescribing, or apps that kind of tackle low acuity problems, sleep rather than insomnia. And then we kind of move into digital therapy. And digital therapy, we need to kind of have those apps that have 
good evidence base for their effectiveness. Those randomized controlled trials supported by real world evidence and that have been shown to kind of work with different kind of client groups experiencing different kind of conditions. And so these are likely to kind of be medical devices. They might be the, the cognitive behavioral therapy apps, video consultations, messaging with clinicians. And then lastly, you've got the administrative and support ones, those that help you book appointments, you know, uh, helping kind of keep your medical records, etc. So being able to decide which of the technologies we want at what point and deciding which kind of area they're kind of tackling is going to be kind of really helpful. So based on that, how do we then evaluate those applications? Well, there's four key elements to this as well. Firstly, there's data and privacy. So the important thing is that we need to know that things are GDPR compliant. They're going to hold our data private and actually they're not going to share it without our permission. And, and even if it was with our permission, we should know who it's being shared with and why. There should be a good and straightforward consent policy, but also security. And both with data privacy and security, these are very sensitive areas. It might be for well-being, but it might be actually kind of diagnosable kind of mental health. And so we want to feel secure that the information and our interaction with those technologies is secure. And therefore, we are looking at things like Cyber Essentials, ISO 20001. So we're looking at that. But beyond that regulatory compliance, we also need to look at user experience. You know, those structured treatment interventions, they may have more text. They might not necessarily be as, as an engaging experience as some of the well-being ones, which may be gamified. And therefore, we need to kind of be able to say, what's the right experience for us? What's the right experience that's going to help us interact and engage with that technology? And actually, and it sounds strange, build a relationship with that technology. And that sounds strange, you know, relationship with my mobile device. But actually, we already have a relationship with our device. I can guarantee we have one because if we're in therapy and we miss a, a, an appointment with a therapist, we're a bit annoyed at ourselves and a bit disappointed, um, but we'll rebook an appointment, etc., and attend the next one. If we leave our mobile phone at home and we go to the shops, you can guarantee that you're probably bereft and thinking, oh, my gosh, what's happening? And you'll have a loss experience, which is very strange. So we do have a relationship. And so we're looking for technologies that build upon that relationship. But equally, we need that clinical assurance and that clinical and professional assurance needs to be proportional to the type of app there is. And so you do for digital therapy want good randomized control trials. You do want that evidence base for it. Um, but you may not necessarily require that elsewhere. And so how ORCA exists? Well, ORCA stands for the Organization for the Review of Care and Health Apps. This is our bread and butter. We help organizations and people find the right technologies. We've done the assessment of those four criteria, those four areas. We can kind of categorize those apps into those different types. And we can kind of match the person to that application through kind of searches, et cetera, and filters. And we've been doing this across 12 different countries. And so this is kind of why it's really important that you look for things that tell you that that app has been certified. Either it has an ORCA review or an ORCA score attached to it, or it has an NHS DTAC, um, which stands for the Digital Technology Assessment Criteria. Now, that's only kind of, uh, you know, uh, important when we're kind of talking about those apps, you know, in terms of being able to help people with their mental health and well-being. But it's really important that we do look for those kind of criteria. Okay. And then, you know, ORCA does bring all of those together in terms of both a digital formulary for uh, professionals to use and a digital library for people to access. And because we're in about 70 percent of NHS areas, there's likely to be an app library um, that you or people that, that you know can access in some way. So if you would like to kind of uh, get in contact with us, we can kind of point you in the direction of various different uh, areas. I'm kind of aware of time. I've done a lot of the talking over the top of the hour. Are there any kind of questions uh, that people would like to, to kind of ask uh, about anything that I've covered today?
please feel free to unmute and ask your questions. We'll be a bit interactive in this session. Um, if you're going to share any personal experiences, please um, do do know that it won't be captured in the final recording that we share. So, so please be open and honest. I've managed to kind of um, beat everyone into submission in terms of kind of their questions. Silence. Today. I think you've answered all the questions, Lloyd. That's right. Fantastic uh, presentation. I guess we're at the top of the hour. So, so I'm, I'm always mindful of kind of time and not overrunning. So I really appreciate the kind of the opportunity to kind of talk today. And uh, thank you very much for, for, for everyone kind of coming along and, and, and listening to me talk around digital mental health.